Okay, welcome to video number 28 in the Marine Invertebrate Biology series. And this is the fourth in the Phylum Echinodermata series. And we're going to be looking at class Echinoidea, which are the urchins. You can see quite a variety of shapes and um, uh, spine configurations from the classic henna to the pencil urchin and even something that looks a bit like a limpet that you find on high energy wave shores, just like limpets. Something that spines would be swept off the rock, but uh, these shapes that look uh, streamlined allow them to stick on. So we're talking about sea urchins, but also something called sand dollars and heart urchins. Um, you'll have you have sand dollars in your shell collection. Heart urchins, uh, you will find if you go to Pilot Bay and have a dive. Uh, but we're going to have a look at all of those. They're all in the same class, Echinoidea. And what is something that is a common characteristic to this class is that the ossicles that we've seen before, um, and we mentioned this in the first video on echinoderms, uh, they are fused into a shell, and that's called a test, whereas there was connective tissue between the ossicles that allowed flexibility in the other classes. This one, they're fused together. So there's a little less chance of any kind of repair. Uh, if they're broken, that's pretty much it for the animal. But uh, these ones are fused into a hard test that is, is like what you would find with a kinna. They're still radially symmetrical, but some of them have something called bilateral, secondary bilateral symmetry. And we will have a look at that a little bit later. So we've only looked at bilateral symmetry or radial symmetry so far, or asymmetry in the sponges, but we're going to be looking at something called secondary bilateral symmetry, where they almost exhibit two types of symmetry in the uh, body form. Okay, so let's think about the test for a little bit. The test is the kina shell. And they have two different types of, two different areas in lines. Um, the ambulacral, which we remember from the asteroidians, are the, the area that have the podia or two feet sticking out of them. Well, the, the same in the echinoidea, the ambulacral area, is the part that means ambulacral means walking that has the podia or the two feet sticking out. And then the interambulacral area, that's the area between the ambulacral areas, inter. Okay. So we know that the uh, that there are spines on a kinna, and we will see in, a, in the next some images that the uh, spines are attached to these things, these little bumps on the test. And those are called tubercles. Um, so the, they can be a really nasty thing and something to, to be sure to avoid in the tropics, uh, especially. You can get um, kin of spines. And some of you will probably have had this happen, where kin of spines will break off in your skin. And if you can't pull them out and the skin closes over, you'll probably get a bad infection that will... Um, uh, that you'll need to open up, but they they're covered in barbs, and some of them are, are can be incredibly painful because of these poison sacs. Uh, body surface covered with various types of dysalaria. All right, we've covered that in asteroidia, but they they work just the same. All right, so let's have a look here at the at these um, photographs. Here you go. These barbs are for the big spines, or sorry, these tubercles are for the big spines. The little ones are for the small spines. And you may or may not have ever noticed this with a kinna, but they'll have different sizes of spines, not just the long, not just one size of spine, the long ones, but they also have like small internal spines, which makes it very interesting if you take a uh, kinna and you touch it with your finger. At the outside, you'll see a very different reaction than if you, say, put a pencil or something 
thin in and you touch the canna in below the level of defense of the outside spine, you'll get quite a different reaction. So very worth doing sometime while you're diving. Uh, they have a madriporite. This is at the very top. Um, they have this thing called the periproct, which is a, uh, when you find a kina shell, you'll usually find a small hole at the top of the kina shell if it has been dead and um, that has been eroded. Now, this area is not fused together. These are very much like the ossicles of starfish that are have some connective tissue. And this is where the anus is. Um, the, there are genital pores at, called gonopores on at each of five sections because these have pentamerous radial symmetry and uh, a madriporite at the top of the shell. And here is uh, how the, the spine is attached. Now, if you go and you're diving and you touch a kina uh, gently and just observe it, you'll see that the, the um, spines are not fixed in position, but can move around. Now, if they were fused to the shell, then they wouldn't be able to move. So uh, when we look at how that um, spine is attached, it's actually attached by uh, no different than your shoulder to your to your chest. Uh, the ball, in, it's a kind of a ball and socket joint here. So here's the ball and here's the sock, or sorry, here's the, yeah, here's the ball and here's the socket that goes around it. And this thing can rotate 360 degrees. It's attached by skin and muscle um, and connective tissue to the in place, but it is not attached. It's not fused to the to the sheath. Um, and this is a really interesting image. Diadema is very common. Um, we have them. You might find them if you're diving at very like offshore islands, like or rocks and the like. But when you look at very closely at the um, uh, the shaft of the spine, you'll see that it has lots and lots of these tiny little barbs. And this is interesting because you can tell that this is a defensive thing. This is not something where the, the kina wants to stab something and hold it there. And it's actually trying to um, keep things from getting anywhere near the body of it. Um, this is the direction of the away from the body, okay? And the body would be down here. And if something were to slide down this um, the spine, let's say it's attacking like a, a trigger fish or something that wants to try to eat these and they do predate on the kina. What, ha what happened as this thing slides in is these barbs will prevent it from, from sliding too far down because they go against the direction of something attacking. And they also um, are very brittle, so they'll break off, in which case they break off and uh, remain painful within the body of the, the attacker. Okay, so the regular urchins, uh, the oral surface is directed down. Okay, they have these things called buccal podia. All right, we know what podia is, and we know this root word buccal, which means around the mouth. Okay, podia are two feet. These are modified for feeding. Okay, they also, and we've uh, covered all of this in that diagram before. All right, so again, uh, here are the... Well, this is the top surface. We've seen this before. Um, this is, are the these are the buccal podia. These very specialized um, two feet that manipulate food. There's the mouth, and just like we saw in the ophiuroids, they've got five plates that come together. Uh, this thing and macerate food or snip off things, little bits of algae. These are called the uh, teeth of the Aristotle's lantern, and also notice that these things have gills. You probably have never noticed that there was something called there were gills on a, a, a kenna, even if you've been uh, 
involved in collecting them at uh, you if you I'd be surprised if you look closely enough to see these things they are not something that is a, a feature that's very noticeable but they have gills outside the test all right there are other ones called irregular urchins that um where the test is fused but it's also uh, has a secondary bilateral form uh, symmetry and these are covered with small spines much smaller than the kina and they burrow through the sand now spines as you can imagine uh would be something that would catch in sand if you're so they all lay flat in one direction facing back against the direction of uh, their burrowing so this thing will go through the substrate in this way with these spines laying down they can be erected for defense but generally they're um, uh, they lay in away from the direction that the thing is burrowing through the sand So something a little bit different than the uh, other echinoderms that we've seen. These ones have uh, podia that are on the top surface, where close to the surface of the sand, where there's the, going to be the most oxygen. And the podia, or two feet, they have this petal-like pattern that are specialized for respiration. Lots of surface area with the podia. They're like gills. Okay, uh, oral podia, the ones around the mouth are modified for feeding and they don't have suckers, much like the brittle stars. And they um, have adapted to go more uh, mouth and oral area towards the front and periproctinatus towards the back because they move directionally. This is kind of how they move through the sand. So this area here they're non-selective deposit feeders they just eat that means they eat any old dirt they're feeding on uh, the dirt the sediment within the uh, in the subsurface area uh, eating it all or dissolve, digesting the organic material and out it goes through the back area so in that case it pays to be more bilaterally symmetrical and uh, tapered so you can move directionally through the sand more easily. And then as we saw before, the top area with these petaloid um, ambulacral areas are modified for breathing, for, um, for respiration. Uh, so we have something called like a, much like a sand dollar that is, um, can be secondary, can have secondary bilateral symmetry as well. So, yeah, sand dollars, as we say, they've got these spines that are quite club-like that are used for movement. And various, uh, the, the tube feet without suckers have these little um, protrusions on the end of them. They're not suckers, but they uh, move a bolus of mucus and uh, organic material towards the mouth on the food, this food groove on the oral surface. And again, you see the club-like uh, spines of the uh, of the sand dollar. When you look at a sand dollar, you might not think that they have spines, but you can if you look very closely or under a microscope, they will have these spines. Most echinoidea graze on algae, but they also feed on uh, other things. They could uh, sometimes even be seen to be biting away at uh, uh, scavenging a dead material. Um, they, they feed with this five-toothed apparatus called Aristotle's Lantern. We'll show, look at that a little bit in the uh, next couple of slides. The teeth constantly grow much like a, a rodent's front teeth. And here's a picture of the Aristotle's Lantern. And um, You can stop, stop this and have a look at this writing. Uh, there is a uh, there are a couple of videos that I have put up that, and an animation on YouTube and on the lesson plan that will uh, allow you to see animations of the Aristotle's Lantern. 
Okay, so they, the buccal cavity, pharynx, those are in the lantern, lead to the esophagus and stomach. The esophagus is very long. If you ever break open a kidda, you'll see these little green balls, which are actually bites of algae that are being digested. They have a very, very long intestine, uh, as most uh, herbivores do. It uh, takes a long time to digest cell walls. And you can see the uh, of plants. You can see the length of the intestine going all the way up to out through the anus. Whereas carnivores have very short intestines. So this is just an interesting fact. We had no idea until nuclear tests started happening in the 50s, 60s, atmospheric nuclear tests, when lots of radioactive nucleotides were uh, scattered through the atmosphere and incorporated into the shells of mollusks, we could start to date some of these things. Some urchins, some kina, are could be as old as 200 years. So we really are constantly surprised at how old things are. There are clams that can live for 500 years. Uh, so we, we have literally no idea how old some corals and uh, sponges might be. Could be thousands and thousands of years old. Uh, so reproduction for uh, echinoidea, they're dioecious, so they're either male or female. If you break open a kina and it has a very uh, orange row, that's probably a female. And if it has a white row, that's probably a sperm sac, which is a male. Okay, they are, they broadcast spawn. The larva develop into something that you don't need to know, a kind of fluteus, but uh, they are, that's just an interesting uh, thing that you'll often see while uh, looking in the water column, and um, they sink to the bottom after after several months. So they sit in the water column. For this is what they look like uh, when they're swimming around. These are uh, echinoderm larvae. Could be starfish. Could be um, could be uh, kina. But uh, the this ones with the long spines tend to be echinoids. And just uh, one last little uh, snippet, because this video is incredibly long. Some of these um, things will actually secrete a enzyme that will erode rock, and they can live collecting uh, algae on, in very high, vol high energy environments. Um, and they carve out a little, actually, depression in the rock where they can um, jam themselves in with their spines. That's it for Echinoidea. We'll see you in the next video.